Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Tony Lope, and welcome to the Innovation Law Club Africa Chats today with Viola and Michelle. Um, this is looking forward to this conversation because not every day you get to chat with two interesting, um, phenomenal ladies who are chatting, of course, in the financial spaces around Africa and in the world at large. So I'm hoping that you know this will be an interesting conversation and you know something to you know, something that will be instructive for, you know, everyone that's listening and whoever it is that gets to watch this much later on. Um, I think nice thing will be to start with the introductions. I will let, again, just in terms of providing background, um, Viola is a co-founder co of Amba, the FinTech um, financial services group, you know, that provides solutions across uh, SMEs, companies, regulators. I think she'll talk more about you know, what Uvamba does just to give you know, proper information around that. But I'll let her introduce herself. And then after she introduces herself, I'll also let Michelle introduce herself as well. Raula. Thank you so much for having Michelle and I on your call. You're right. I'm the co-founder and president of Uvamba Solutions, Inc. We um, like to think of ourselves as a trade tech solutions innovator that helps banks to do more of what we like to do, which is fund SMEs across emerging markets with capital and solutions for business growth via trade. We're focused on inclusion and we're in focused on ensuring that Africans learn to get used to being wealthy and that innovations will help them to do more of what they do successfully. And of course, we'll get more into that. FinTech is an exciting market and it's really, really good to be here. Thank you. That's such a laudable and like huge vision, making sure and helping Africans make sure that they get wealthy, but we will certainly get to that. Michelle? Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having myself and Viola. Um, Viola also gave us that awesome introduction into what we do as a company. I am the legal associate, so I help Viola and Obama Solutions, Inc. Um, be able to do whatever to do and, you know, achieve their objectives, um, providing, you know, legal support. Lovely. Thank you, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> I think, the, like, the very first place to start would be just to get a sense of, you know, in some detail what Uvamba does, the sort of, I mean, I could, what's what I was going through your website and I saw some interesting things. You work with SMEs, you work with trade people, you work with regulators, you work with banks and, you know, you work with tech companies. That just seems to be like, you know, you sort of built like an ecosystem to provide support and it'd be interesting to hear, you know, from you what all of that means. Would you like me to go first? Yes. <laughs> And you hit the nail on the head, it's about ecosystem. There are so many way, places from which to start this subject. What Obamba does is resolve the issue of financial inclusion as well as making access to capital possible. Those are two very simple ideas, but from the African reality, the challenge that we encountered was that banks dispense capital in the form of loans. Loans do not always financial to business growth. We need business growth and increased productivity in order to drive the amount of capital that's available in any system. And for the case of Africa, we're talking about more than 400 million small and medium enterprises who are in some form of informal business or small business, and they can't walk into a bank and get money. Mm -hmm. Even when they do get their hands on money, now we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution how do we quantify and account for what happened to that money? And how do we figure out the best course of action to help banks do more successful capital disbursement to these businesses? So by helping the regulator to figure out the best way to create an economy that will support growth and the best way to help these policymakers support the growth of fintech in their regions, we are the ones that create the dashboards that collect and look at all of the activity happening in far reaches of the economy. Most of Africa is involved in buying or selling something and that especially mm -hmm. impacts women. But these are the very groups that are so lucrative as a joint market, can't go in and get a loan. It's not fast, it's not efficient, it has high default rates, something else needs to happen. Not in, in well, at least since we started in 2013, we had to learn how to change the questions we ask. Learning how to ask the right questions, I think, is the beginning of a legal 
um, practice and a legal discipline that is positive, that works, that is conducive and correct for Africa. FinTech solution originators and innovators have to learn how to ask the question. And for us, the question was, why doesn't lending build growth? Why do banks and the legal environment not understand and support what we're trying to do? And it doesn't help that startups often don't know exactly what they're doing. They've got an idea. So you've got all these disparate pieces trying to create an ecosystem. And it's, it isn't until you get the right teams and you start to ask the right questions and get the right answers that you can start to create a healthy ecosystem. This is a long-term journey that involves all of the people that you mentioned in your introduction. You know, I'm just trying to think through some of the things that you said. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, that if you look at you know, most governments in Africa, or if you look at central banks or Ministry of Finance, you know, there's always this, I mean, I can speak for Nigeria, you know, for example, the CBN has different facilities and windows, you know, for traders, for exporters, for agricultural farmers, you know, different schemes like that. What I'm hearing you say is, you know, to an extent, has this been effective or has this been working, you know, has this much required capital, has it got into the hands of the traders that actually need to get them or you know is there something else that these got you know that a government or regulators or central banks or whoever it is should be doing just in terms of having the right asking the right questions or having the right information or data to make the right decision in terms of making sure that capital is actually in the right in the hands of the right people is was that a fair what's it called you know assessment of the situation from your end given you know when you started in 2013 and where we're at now it's very fair. In fact, just recently, Michelle and I were working together on all of the legal underpinning for our authorized reseller uh, program that we have in um, throughout sub-Saharan Africa, where we've got new partners joining us asking for um, the authority to license our technology to banks or to use our technology to do their own alternative finance and trade finance origination in their markets. And when Michelle and I sat down and thought about how do we want our technology to affect that ecosystem, it brought us repeatedly back to the drawing board because we have a long-term vision for how to integrate good legal practice with good business practice in order to become simple clear and easy for small businesses to approach us and easy for banks to feel confident that they can rely on our technology to keep them compliant and that we will do what we say we think that the, incos the ecosystem needs for growth. So yes, Tolulukwe, you have the very right idea. Asking questions and creating an ecosystem is a very long distance thinking process and the innovation sometimes outruns the, um, the physical environment. And sometimes it's enough of a catalyst to bring about abrupt change. I'm gonna um, hand it over to Michelle to ask her to share with you and the rest of the group about her own journey coming from a really strong traditional legal discipline to seeing how law can suddenly become a creative element in fintech and in innovation because I really love the work that we've done together. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, like <clears throat> as Viola said, yeah, I, I did come from a, a very traditional background where where everything is kind of handed to you. Um, you are able to find information about excuse me, you're able to find in, um, information about those who you're doing business with by just using a database, or you can call them without worrying about you know time differences or um, different interruptions with, with pow power and all that. Like there were, so I definitely, I would say that the background that I've coming from, I know earlier I was telling you to Lupe that I've, you know, worked at with banks and other companies here in the US where, you know, that's more established in terms of, you know, pre-colonization and they, everything is pretty much already there. Whereas now that I'm working, you know, with African countries, um, and also countries in the, uh, on the middle, in the Middle East, it's a lot harder to, to just have that synergy. And it just, it, what it takes is um, just being creative and meeting people and meeting companies where they are. And I think that Viola, especially like that's been her, um, 
her goal. A lot of times I'm like, okay, well, traditionally this is what the contract should be like. And she's like, well, I spoke to them. This is where they are. So a lot of times it's just scaling back and being able to be that innovator. And um, like she said, like we, we champion financials, you know, inclusion. And it's just a lot of time just scaling back and being creative. Yes, we have the traditional, obviously, you know, terms in place in the contract, but we take into effect, um, into, um, into consideration the, the country's factors, um, the people that we're doing, well, the companies that we're doing, you know, transactions and business with, we take into account what their situation is, what our end goal is, the long-term goal. Um, and yes, it's, it's forced me to just be very creative and, you know, think outside the box. And I think that, you know, a lot of attorneys in the space will have to do so in order to, you know, create this ecosystem and when, you know, just to produce and progress um, awesome, awesome work in the FinTech space. I'm going to give an example, Tololukwe, Tolo of what she's talking well, about. Mm -hmm. When we used to partner with microfinance institutions, we wanted to co-fund loans, quote unquote, with them. Mm -hmm. We thought it was a smart way, as you see in the fintech space, especially in Nigeria, especially the great work that the CBN has done with, um, with sandboxes, for example. Mm -hmm. We've got groups that are coming in with payment solutions and other solutions and are piggybacking on the licenses of some of the, the great banks. Asset um, Access Bank is one that's really, really great. Fidelity, all of these great um, banks in Nigeria. But when we did that with microfinance institutions, the first thing that became very clear to us is that their legal approach to compliance and lending didn't have any real risk elements and was so framed in trying to prevent anything bad from happening that it was very clear to us, many groups do not know how to creatively use legal and business models to promote growth. Many of these systems are designed to prevent something bad from happening. These are such polar opposites. It's yeah. not possible to get really healthy year after year growth outcomes. So what- Sorry, Raul, sorry Raul, I apologies. Just wanted to make a clarification. So my understanding of what you're saying is just in terms of what you're dealing with, and again, apologies, were you dealing with traditional microfinance banks or you were dealing with like microfinance banks that are being run by, you know, some of the tech people that we have today, you know, because again, thinking about it, it's like you're right, you're actually right just in terms of like risk management procedures, the regulations and all of that for that. And it's, you know, there's a tendency for like the traditional microfinance banks to look at this from a particular, you know, risk averse perspective as opposed to how do I create or how do I make this work for my customers? Well, you're right. And it brings into question, what is the role of financial institutions in Africa today? Mm -hmm. Previously, their role was to take deposits and use your money to lend to other people. That's a transformation, yeah. But yeah, so lending, credit, those are banking classic tools. Mm -hmm. Traditional credit doesn't actually work for individuals who are not traditional companies. And traditional credit and lending um, does not have the flexibility to say, well, maybe not this, maybe that. Here's an example. You get um, a woman, the very first transaction that we did in Cameroon when we used to work with microfinance institutions, she was a pharmacist. Banks look at that as science. They don't look at that as real business, as she's a woman. There is no legal... Um, ecosystem that says you may not discriminate against gender in banking in African nations. But as the general, there's a general, what's it called, rules, at least in our constitution, that prevents you from discriminating against That's people. Nigeria. Yes. Other okay. parts of Latin Nigeria. <laughs> Africa, Africa, which I constantly hammer on because that's where we are, that's where my family are from. That's not quite enforceable. There are such subtle differences between what is observed law and what is observable. For example, in much of um, Central Africa, if you have an issue with a customer, in the case of Avamba, when we used to do this co-funding, people used to bring land houses and what they call a hypothec to, in order to collateralize and secure a lending facility with a traditional bank. 
We had to disrupt customers who kept on wanting that from us when that's not what we do. Now, um, when we were running a beta test and working with microfinance institutions and we had customers coming in with land titles and houses, that was really mortgaging. That's not really lending, it's not risk management, and it's completely mismatched to the quantities of capital that they need to grow. Now, when that transaction, when that loan defaults, you would imagine that the contract you have, you walk into a court and it is presided over with fairness, not where we are. Most people will take that contract or will go to a police officer. The police officer summons everybody on what they call a convocation and will begin to preside over the dispute. That police officer is not a business professional. He's actually asked you to bring paper and ink for his printer. He is not going to make any kind of uh, report or log anything into the court system in order to go through due process. Mm -hmm. And if he or she does, it will stay within the court system for years, slowing business down and sludging up the system. FinTech innovators in this part of the world, especially Ovamba, have to figure out smart and creative ways to use the law as they know it in order to bring about outcomes that are in complete contradiction to the engagement of police officers who want to preside over a business case. At what point do we stop doing this nonsense? Well, it stops happening when companies like Ovamba and others begin to figure out ways in which to conduct business to avoid them. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the powerful things that happens from innovation. It comes from learning to thread the needle so very carefully. Now in the Africa that we all dream of, being able to do that and then come to say, I'm bringing my case for review in order to make adjustments. Now that happens in Nigeria in your sandboxes where they can experiment to see how a change will affect the greater market. Mm -hmm. We are working with policy uh, and regulators to show them a process by which to push and test an idea through the legal lens in order to bring about business outcomes that will bring about growth for everybody else. It's so difficult. We even had a situation, Tololukwe, where we went to a bank, a well-known one, and asked to speak to the, uh, the trust and um, escrow department. They said, what's that? And we had to explain to them, we need to be able to have contract paper-driven um, deals that you guys know the rules by which to disperse mm -hmm. or to hold yeah. or to enforce a contract. We even have to teach our staff that they don't have that. So we have to be very creative at how we deal with law. It's making people like Michelle really valuable. Nobody can take Michelle from me, sorry. But these are the things that would be cut that in the Africa we think of tomorrow, these precedents, especially African continental free trade agreement, they need to know and see and anticipate because this is going to happen repeatedly. <clears throat> Emily, some of the interesting points that you raised, and I, I, I might like to defer a bit to be that uh, speaking again from my experience working in Nigeria and, and to an extent also, you know, my idea of, you know, some of the systems in Ghana would be that, um, even for loans transaction, you, so you wouldn't if you wouldn't be in a situation where your recourse would be to go to a police station or to engage with a police officer just in terms of enforcing your collateral or security doc that has been provided to you because you know ideally your your standard financing document here would immediately indicate whether you know this matter is going to be a, um, going to be settled by the courts or it'd be settled by an arbitrator and you know so for the banks there's a fairly on the common process here where you know if you don't repay you know, notice is sent to you and then it's time for enforcement it goes to court in fact what you would have in, mo in some cases would be before the bank proceeds to court to enforce the borrower would have gone to court to try to preempt you know in a bit to preempt the bank so I, I i'm starting to think that you know the system in the francophone countries sort of differ materially in terms of the law <clears throat> excuse me in terms of the enforcement and all of that for um what would i call it now just in terms of general financial transactions but you know i would say that i would say that maybe then they, they need there needs to be some catching up on their end and you know that's you know there's going to be work of educating and orienting them, you know, renting regulators and whatever it is, which is what Uvamba is 
looks like you're doing in, in the francophone <laughs> areas of Africa. The other point that I was going to, the other thing that I was going to ask you was, you seem to also not be um, a fan of <clears throat> requesting collateral security for loans. And so I think, I'm not sure if there's still a regulation, but there used to be a regulation. Yeah, there's, there's actually a regulation in Nigeria that for loans of a certain amount, you'd need to have, you'd need to provide a collateral. And it's seen as a, you know, credit enhancement. Um, it's seen as a credit enhancement tool here, just in terms of deterring people from defaulting. And I wonder, you know, whether you see it that way. And if you think that, um, you know, taking security for loans of, I mean, for loans to individuals for a certain amount, I'm clearly a fan of making it unsecured loans, you know, but for loans to traders or business people, let's say means, you know, of a, of a particular amount, I, I sort of understand <clears throat> the rationale for, you know, requesting that, you know, some of these loans that um, are collateralized, you know, with security, your know, like title, title documents, or even titles to the assets that are being financed. And I wondered, you know, why you have, or why you think otherwise, or why you'd be a fan of, you know, you know, unsecured facilities. I am not a fan of unsecured facilities for Africa. And I'm going to hand it over to Michelle in a minute, because you've just hit on why creativity does such surprising things. Because of the very reasons you said, we knew that for financial inclusion, if you're a woman or a second wife in a polygamous situation, or you've never, you're young, you've never owned a, <coughs> house, owned a house, how are you supposed to? Um, I can't hear you. She's if, muted. If you've never owned a house, you've never bought land and you're young, how are you supposed to be able to uh, get financially included if one of the key requirements is property? So when Michelle first approached Avamba, she came to us because she was very excited by how we had used Sharia law and digitized it into a technology innovation to support non-collateralized uh, traditional lending. And that's why Avamba, you'll never hear us say that we make loans and we talk about transactions. So Michelle, did you want to jump in to talk about how because of what Tololupe has described, we looked at ways to approach um, financial inclusion from the standpoint of trade and inventory versus direct lending, if you want to. Yes, definitely. So that's one of the innovative things um, that Obama does. Um, it kind it cuts out um, the middleman and, and it makes this, you know, the, the opportunity for, like, like she said, women, um, young people who may not have, you know, property, but there's other ways for them to engage and to get, you know, to expand their business and grow their business. Um, one thing, like she mentioned, uh, we do, one thing that we do is we do provide the inventory. That's another way that we can lend um, so that it doesn't comes this, it doesn't become this drastic, you know, thing that we're property that they do not have. <laughs> Sorry, Michelle, <clears throat> I was just to interrupt you. Was, so when you say you provide inventory, what do you, so what do you do with that information? So, you know, when you, you so say I, wa I wanted to get facility from you to um, acquire, um, you know, sewing machines that I need for my business or so whatever it is. And then, you know, I already let you know that if I'm getting the sewing machines from this person, I'm getting three and that's the inventory or whatever it is. What do you, what do you do with that information? And the reason why I ask is, you know, there's also a concept at least that I'm familiar with under, under common law where you're able to actually take security over that inventory. And I wanted to be sure if that's what you're referring to, if what you're referring to is something else. That is it. Sorry, so well, well, go ahead. When we say acquire, we, when customers apply for a transaction with Ovamba on Ovamba Plus, our mobile app, what we're doing is analyzing the inventory, where they're getting it from, and their potential to sell it within a contractual period of time. This is called a murabaha. It's Islamic mm -hmm. finance. We yeah. recognize that. But because we were looking at the regulatory environment, how difficult it is to succeed as a bank and its cost of operation is so high compared to um, what it will take to have the kind of impact that we want and flexibility, helping customers acquire the inventory that they need to sell allows us to take a stock in hand and have um, a control, physical and legal ownership of that inventory that they buy back from us over a period of time. So we have threaded the legal requirement to not be a bank, 
to not do lending without a license, to not charge interest because we charge a fee for this. And everything that we did based on our understanding of law led us to an innovation that was highly applicable to African realities and the sectors that we want to serve. Is that right, Michelle? Yes, yeah, definitely right. And then also, she, I just want to piggyback off what, what Viola said about the interest bearing. I mean, here, um, sometimes the interest can be more than the actual principal, <laughs> and mm -hmm. that causes a lot of issues. So um, that was what was interesting to me, because here, like, like she already said, that there's non-interest um, bearing trade, um, which obviously with alternative finance, that's considered um, haram or, you know, it's, it's frowned upon, it's prohibited. So that was something that was very interesting to me. Um, another uh, factor that I, I wanted to talk about too was, um, I know we've already discussed like Nigeria, Ghana, the laws seem to be, you know, more advanced. Um, but in Cameroon, that's not what we're dealing with. I, I've, I've been in situations where I'm like, um, Viola, why are we explaining to them you know, why this, <laughs> what this is. And it, it takes a lot of, you know, patience, creativity, like as, like we already discussed, and also resources. There's been times where our company has had to go down to, um, you know, a site just to say, okay, this is what we mean. This is what we're talking about. Do you think that you may have resources? And it, it becomes this whole educational um, process. Um, another way to be creative, I know that we've talked about the alternative finance. Um, it's also just making sure that there's access for everyone. That's that's the reason why we, we have this alternative <laughs> finance um, measure that we're using because like we said, not everyone is at the same level playing field. You know, laws are not as advanced as other countries. We wish it was that way, but it's 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 just not that way. And like we said, enforcement is not the same as having it written down. Some of some African countries, their constitution is almost identical to the United States, but we know that you know, implementation is, is not exactly, it's, it's usually never the same. Plus we have two laws running concurrently in Cameroon. It's the, the only place that I know that is running both civil and whatever the other law is. So depending where you're standing physically, it will depend on which of the laws you are using. And then on one side, we've got advocates and um, whatever they call themselves. Uh, and then you've got lawyers and barristers. So. The Cameroon yeah. is very, very interesting. It's the perfect place in Africa by which to um, experiment with a number of different African realities in one place all at once. Two law systems, Anglophone and Francophone, um, mm -hmm. Christian and yeah. Islamic groups. Uh, um, it's just very varied. We had to really bring in smart people like Michelle and others and work with different groups of um, legal group, uh, t uh, practitioners in order to, to, to support the fact that when you're innovating, you're creating something new that may not have existed before. There isn't much precedence and there isn't much that says that you should or should not do something. You'll probably end up having to uh, beg for forgiveness versus ask for permission from legal groups and from regulators. And most of them are behind the eight ball as it relates to market forces and what is happening. Especially if you're doing, um, you're trying to bring ideas that are from outside Africa's um, boundaries inside and you now have to run it through some sort of a treatment in order for it to harmonize, in order for it to work, for it to be investable. We have investors, There are we have to um, marry SEC law which Michelle is pretty practiced at, and try to harmonize that with something that is Islamic, that also works for Africans and SMEs. It gives us so much um, dense material and dense experience by which to be able to talk very intelligently, even though I'm not a lawyer, about the outcomes of these things. I think we've even turned ourselves into a mini sandbox all on our own because of the, the might and the size of the ambition that we have and the way we want to do that. Tololupu, I absolutely love the fact that you're very concerned about unsecured <laughs> lending because when we sit down with investors and say, and they want to um, say things like, well, why can't you do micro loans? Why do you want Africans to say micro sized? Why would you want your money put at risk, unsecured, when the legal environment will not allow you to pursue that successfully? I don't know anywhere on the continent maybe South Africa, maybe North Africa, where you can do that easily. 
we have to find other ways to get that capital into the system. You know, this, this sort of actually makes me wonder whether, you know, the way we've sort of run banking in Nigeria or in Africa, you know, as a whole, is the right way. Like, I mean, some of the things or rules or regulations that we have, you know, generally in most African countries, have either been, you know, poor substitutes or poor copies or what's available in the US and Europe. And again, looking at the level of uh, development politically, economically, and even just even something has been able to enforce a contract. I wonder if, you know, if we're serious about moving the needle on providing financial inclusion and access, whether we should be restructuring the banking system, you know, whether we should be looking to, should we still be looking to Europe and US or should we be looking at Asia or should we be looking at a, a system that actually does recognize our own peculiarities. And I think you've already sort of mentioned that, you know, along the way, like, you know, there's no point asking for collateral, asking a woman to provide a property as collateral if she doesn't even have the rights, you know, she's not really able to own a property in the first place because automatically you've sort of disqualified her from getting access to that credit because she's not going to be able to meet the, you know, meet the requirements. And, you know, when you even think about some other things just in terms of, um, like you said, risk, you know, risk procedures that some of these banks have to comply with or they just put in place in terms of, I'm trying to safeguard my capital. I'm trying to preserve my capital from being eroded. And that puts you in a position where your default position is not exactly to lend or to put your capital at risk. Mm -hmm. And again, you're doing that from the perspective of, you know, the regulations required to do this, the laws required to do this, you know, the systems or whatever it is that you have to comply with. And I wonder, it'd just be nice to hear your thoughts again, even as we look to round, round up this conversation as to whether you think, you know, whether the banking system as we currently have it across Africa, and this, you know, this goes between Francophone and Anglophone, whether it needs to be re-engineered and what you think your, the ideal system or structure would be. That's a very meaty conversation and it's not something that changes overnight. In fact, I would predict that banking will never change. Its, its roots are so ancient. What needs to change is how people understand and define what banks can do for them and mm -hmm. what also needs to change and the ideal situation would be for innovators to work with supporting the central bank and the policymakers with making um, a business environment and an environment that is conducive to success and growth. Right now in Africa, we have issues with uh, liquidity, foreign exchange, currency devaluation, settlements, um, banks that have employees that really don't always know what they're doing, or uh, banks and central banks that do not know uh, the power of digitization and need help with that transformation. Right now we have entire policy development that's got very little to do with either the long-term goals of where the country is going or its availability of long-term lending instruments that last more than three to five years and mm -hmm. innovative ways to help small and medium enterprises who are the breadbasket of most environments. The perfect thing I think to have happen here is to um, not so much open the system up to be broken, destroyed and thrown around and then rebuilt because that could take generations and a few hundred years. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to look backwards to who we used to be. Before we had technology, when Africans were the original geeks, but we always talk about the Romans and the Greeks, we had social capital markers that allowed us to know who you could trust. Finance is about trust. Banks are concerned with trust and preservation of assets. So were Africans. Whether you call it Njangi, partner money, box, meeting, susu, um, any of those names, mm -hmm. tontines, we did that. There were very specific penalties for not honoring your contracts. In fact, I would have, yes. Are those, are those, sorry for interrupting, are those scalable? Because again, well, when, I look at, when I look, when I think about that, I think of a relatively closely knit or, you know, individuals that are, what's the right, there's this rule where you say, you know, if I know one person, this person knows at least two or three other people that are connected to them. And I think of, you know, ISUS or similar programs like that. And I wonder, you know, even, even with technology, because again, it's based on trust. 
and to an extent, I'm only able to trust you either because I know you have interacted with you, or I know someone that actually I can rely on the person's judgment as to you know, your trustworthiness. So I think about that and I'm like, okay, if we were to design a system around this, how, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about in terms of how scalable would that be? Would it be something that we could actually replicate on a national or in a statewide basis, even with technology? It's about incorporation. It's about taking features that have good historical outcomes for us. And you're right, some of these groups are very closed. But right now today, this same concept is being done by Facebook and other social media groups who are able to pull data, use AI to find out where are similarities, where are complementations, and what are the potential outcomes of these groups of individuals working together. You, it's very difficult to avoid, even within banking. You are known by the company you keep. It is yeah. very easy. And Ovamba's technology has done this on a very cultural level, taking into account where somebody is and where they're from, what is likely to drive their repayability or lack thereof, and who else is in their network that has success or where they have access to, to other assets. For example, you take an individual who, and I said this in a TED talk before, but if you're a guy, you're in Northern Cameroon or you're in Kano, you're in Sokoto, you've got more than one wife, you've got two or three, you've got two or three pools of assets that make you quite rich and investable. Wealth and rich is a, is a different definition in our continent compared to somewhere else. Classic example of that, the idiots that run around trying to get, um, let's say Americans, to give Africans $2.50 a day because they're so poor and they need to survive. No, this guy has just put all of his children through school. He whipped their butts into shape so that they could get um, all kinds of scholarships. They send him money through remittances every single month. This man has no debt and owns the ground underneath his feet permanently and eats organic vegetables that three or four of his wives have dug up in the back garden. Yes, I am exaggerating with some horrific stereotypes, but the point I am making is that who and what we were is worth referencing when incorporating the best of our success behaviors into everyday banking and finance for Africans today and for tomorrow. We have the ability to be incredibly successful. We need to create a legal environment that supports the best of who we were because what we did was ethical, was socially oriented mm -hmm. and was observed and respected by everybody. People fell into it. We even experimented with how to use traditional leaders as debt collectors or those to enforce the, um, the requirement that the rest of your group, your social group, will downgrade you and not want to do any business with you if you are known to be disrupted to the business environment. These concepts still work, still apply. And that's what central banks cannot see because it's not data extractive, but when it's done across Ovamba's platform or done in, co in conjunction with our app, we do look at that kind of behavior. And when we partner with banks and they license our technology, we give them the ability to interpret that kind of data and information that's either observed anecdotally or actually does happen. And in our case, it's both. That makes Avamba incredibly interesting and quite powerful. And that's why banks licensing our tech is a good idea. You just sort of made a case for like a, a re a reformation of the banking and banking and you know credit system and i really i mean i i to, to a large extent i agree with you and i think that you know um technology definitely you know just makes this thing things easier and it's it, it just be a you know an improved version of what we used to have before and you know just also something that helps us to achieve or move the needle in terms of providing access to credit um I think that we we have certainly maybe probably gone off the time, but this has been a very useful and interesting conversation just in terms of understanding, you know, how your experience around other countries, you know, enforcement of contracts, looking at the risk mechanisms for microfinancing institution and rethinking our access to credit should be, you know, for us. And I, I want to say thank you very much for, for coming up and you know, just for, for sharing your experience. Michelle, I wondered if you wanted to say, you know, something leave us with a gem before we leave. <laughs> um, I will just pick, first of all, to Lope, thank you for moderating this discussion. And also your last question, um, 
I think it's something that we all need to walk away with and think deeply about and also think about what our role is in, mm-hmm. in the development of, you know, the advancement of the banking sector in, in Africa. Um, I also agree that the problem is sometimes you get distracted when you're looking at what other con- countries are doing on Nigeria, or you look at your mates, you're looking at what your mates are doing in the US, you know, or in, the, in Europe, and you're trying to think of how you measure. And the truth is, if you look back into history, at some point, they, and they still, still are copying us. Mm-hmm. And so I think that the, the key is understanding what we're good at, using technology to be the middle, the middle ground or the, or, the, or the channel that connects us to where we're trying to be. And then again, um, just encourage, also educating and encouraging others to get up to speed. Um, I know that we were supposed to talk about, um, well, we we're, were supposed to talk more about like legal frameworks. I think thinking about, look at, for example, the Maasai, Maasai Kenya. Um, they have products, they have goods, and especially with the Africa Free Trade Agre- Agreement, that's supposed to be creating so much, so much, you know, um, so many opportunities. It's supposed to alleviate poverty. I think there's there's something to be said um, about that and where it's going. Um, for example, like I said, the Maasai um, scandal that happened. You know that um, historically, those abroad, the U.S., Europe, Europe, they've taken a lot of our our goods and used it to profit you know, making, for example, like the Maasai people, they're 80, they're 80, 80% of them are below the poverty line. And it's just, it's just to show, it's to show that we need to advance as, as, you know, as a continent, especially when it comes to intellectual property. If we're going to be doing these large scale, you know, trade agreements, I think legally we need to create the framework. And I think it starts with everyone that's on here, everyone in the innovation law club, myself, Viola, you know, FinTechs, trade techs, and we all have a part to play. So thank you so much for inviting us. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Michelle. I think certainly going to walk away with the fact that you we need to, you know, leverage on technology to bridge the gap between where we're at and where we need to be. And everyone really has a role to play, just in terms of even in basic educate education, you know, of people and you know, rethinking how things could should be done or in a way that you know it can be done better to ease things you know and all of that so thank you very much michelle thank you very much val it was really really lovely to have this chat with you and i hope that you have a lovely you know, rest of your day today thank you, you as well thank you so very much it was a joy to be with you all and keep doing what you're doing it's brilliant